Gertrude Stein Gertrude Stein was an American writer of novels, poetry and plays that eschewed the narrative, linear, and temporal conventions of 19th century literature, and a fervent collector of modernist art. She was born in West Allegheny, Pennsylvania, raised in Oakland, California, and moved to Paris in 1903, making France her home for the remainder of her life. For some 40 years, the Stein home at 27 Rue de Fleurus on the left bank of Paris was a renowned Saturday evening gathering place for both expatriate American artists and writers and others noteworthy in the world of vanguard arts and letters, most notably Pablo Picasso. Entree into the Stein Salon was a sought-after validation, and Stein became combination mentor, critic, and guru to those who gathered around her, including Ernest Hemingway, who described the Salon in A Movable Feast. In 1933, Stein published a kind of memoir of her Paris years, the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, written in the voice of Toklas, her life partner. The book became a literary bestseller and vaulted Stein from the relative obscurity of cult literary figure into the light of mainstream attention. Early Life Gertrude Stein, the youngest of a family of five children, was born on February 3, 1874, in Allegheny, Pennsylvania, merged with Pittsburgh in 1907, to upper-class Jewish parents, Daniel and Amelia Stein. German and English were spoken at their home. Stein's father was a wealthy businessman with real estate holdings, and director of San Francisco Street Car Lines, the Market Street Railway, in an era when public transportation was a privately owned enterprise. When Stein was three years old she and her family moved to Vienna and then Paris. Accompanied by governesses and tutors, the Steins endeavored to imbue their children with the cultured sensibilities of European history and life. After a year-long sojourn abroad, they returned to America in 1878, settling in Oakland, California, where Stein attended First Hebrew Congregation of Oakland Sabbath School. Her mother died in 1888 and her father in 1891. Michael Stein, the eldest brother, took over the family business holdings. He arranged for Gertrude and another sister, Bertha, to live with their mother's family in Baltimore after the deaths of their parents. In 1892, she lived with her uncle David Backratch. Backratch had married Fanny Kieser, sister of Gertrude's mother Amelia, in 1877. In Baltimore, Stein met Claribel Cohn and Etta Cohn, who held Saturday evening salons that she would later emulate in Paris. The Cohns shared an appreciation for art and conversation about art and modeled a domestic division of labor that Stein would replicate in her relationship with Alice B. Toklas. Education Radcliffe Stein attended Radcliffe College, then an annex of Harvard University from 1893 to 1897 and was a student of psychologist William James. With James's supervision, Stein and another student, Leon Mendes Solomons, performed experiments on normal motor automatism, a phenomenon hypothesized to occur in people when their attention is divided between two simultaneous intelligent activities such as writing and speaking. These experiments yielded examples of writing that appeared to represent stream of consciousness a psychological theory often attributed to James and the style of modernist authors Virginia Woolf and James Joyce. In 1934, behavioral psychologist B. F. Skinner interpreted Stein's difficult poem Tender Buttons as an example of normal motor automatism. In a letter Stein wrote during the 1930s, she explained that she never accepted the theory of automatic writing, here can be automatic movements, but not automatic writing. Writing for the normal person is too complicated an activity to be indulged in automatically. At Radcliffe, she began a lifelong friendship with Mabel Foot Weeks, whose correspondence traces much of the progression of Stein's life. In 1897, Stein spent the summer in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, studying embryology at the Marine Biological Laboratory. Johns Hopkins William James who had become a committed mentor to Stein at Radcliffe, recognizing her intellectual potential, and declaring her his most brilliant woman student, encouraged Stein to enroll in medical school, 
although Stein professed she had no interest in either the theory or practice of medicine. She spent two years at Johns Hopkins Medical School, failing two courses and leaving without a degree. Ultimately, medical school had bored Stein, and she had spent many of her evenings not applying herself to her studies, but taking long walks and attending the opera. Stein's tenure at Johns Hopkins was marked by challenge and stress. Men dominated the medical field, and the inclusion of women in the profession was not unreservedly or unanimously welcomed. Writing of this period in her life, Things As They Are, 1903, Stein often revealed herself as a depressed young woman dealing with a paternalistic culture, struggling to find her own identity which she realized could not conform to the conventional female role. Her uncorseted physical appearance and eccentric mode of dress aroused comment and she was described as big and floppy and sandaled and not caring a damn. Asked to give a lecture to a group of Baltimore women in 1899, Stein gave a controversial speech titled The Value of College Education for Women, undoubtedly designed to provoke the largely middle-class audience. In the lecture Stein maintained. While a student at Johns Hopkins and purportedly still naive about sexual matters, Stein experienced an awakening of her latent sexuality. Sometime in 1899 or 1900, she became infatuated with Mary Bookstaver who was involved in a relationship with a medical student, Mabel Haynes. Witnessing the relationship between the two women served for Stein as her erotic awakening. The unhappy love triangle demoralized Stein arguably contributing to her decision to abandon her medical studies. In 1902 Stein's brother Leo Stein left for London, and Stein followed. The following year the two relocated to Paris, where Leo hoped to pursue an art career. Art Collection Gertrude and her brother Leo shared living quarters on the left bank of Paris at 27 Rue de Fleurus from 1903 until 1914, when they dissolved their common household. Their residence, located near the Luxembourg Gardens, was a two-story building with adjacent studio. It was here they accumulated the works of art into a collection that would become renowned for its prescience and historical importance. The gallery space was furnished with imposing, Renaissance-era furniture manufactured in Florence, Italy. The paintings lined the walls and tears trailing many feet to the ceiling. Initially illuminated by gaslight, the artwork was later lit by electric light shortly prior to World War I. The joint collection of Gertrude and Leo Stein began in late 1904 when Michael Stein announced that their trust account had accumulated a balance of 8,000 francs. They spent this at Vollard's Gallery, Van Gogh and Sunflowers and three Tahitians, Cezanne's Bathers, and two Renoirs. Leo Stein cultivated important art world connections, enabling the Stein holdings to grow over time. Bernard Berenson hosted Gertrude and Leo in his English country house in 1902, facilitating their introduction to Paul Cezanne and Ambroise Bollard's art gallery. The art collection increased and the walls at Rue de Fleurus were rearranged continually to make way for new acquisitions. In the first half of 1905 the Steins acquired Cezanne's portrait of MME Cezanne and Delacroix's Perseus and Andromeda. Shortly after the opening of the Salon d'Autumn of 1905, on October 18, 1905, the Steins acquired Matisse's Woman with a Hat and Picasso's Young Girl with Basket of Flowers. Henry McBride, art critic for the New York Sun, did much for Stein's reputation in the United States publicizing her art acquisitions and her importance as a cultural figure. Of the art collection at 27 Rue de Fleurus, McBride commented, in proportion to its size and quality. Just about the most potent of any that I have ever heard of in history. McBride also made the observation that Gertrude collected geniuses rather than masterpieces. She recognized them a long way off. By early 1906, Leo and Gertrude Stein's studio had many paintings by Henri Manguin, Pierre Bunard, Pablo Picasso, Paul Cezanne, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, Hanor Daumier, Henri Matisse, and Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. Their collection was representative of two famous art exhibitions that took place during their residence together in Paris, and to which they contributed either by lending their art, or by patronizing the featured artists. The Stein's elder brother, Michael, 
and sister-in-law Sarah, Sally, acquired a large number of Henri Matisse paintings. Gertrude's friends from Baltimore, Clara Bell and Etta Cohn, collected similarly, eventually donating their art collection, virtually intact, to the Baltimore Museum of Art. While numerous artists visited the Stein Salon, many of these artists were not represented among the paintings on the walls at 27 Rue de Fleurus. Where Renoir, Cezanne, Matisse, and Picasso's works dominated Leo and Gertrude's collection, the collection of Michael and Sarah Stein emphasized Matisse. In April 1914 Leo relocated to Settignano, Italy, near Florence, and the art collection was divided. The division of the Steins art collection was described in a letter by Leo. Leo departed with 16 Renoirs, and relinquishing the Picassos and most of Matisse to his sister, took only a portrait sketch Picasso had done of him. He remained dedicated to Cezanne, nonetheless, leaving all the artist's works with his sister, taking with him only a Cezanne painting of five apples. The split between brother and sister was acrimonious. Stein did not see Leo Stein again for more than thirty years, and then threw only a brief greeting on the street. After this accidental encounter, they never saw or spoke to each other again. The Stein's holdings were dispersed eventually by various methods and for various reasons. After Stein's and Leo's households separated in 1914, she continued to collect examples of Picasso's art, which had turned to Cubism, a style Leo did not appreciate. At her death, Gertrude's remaining collection emphasized the artwork of Picasso and Juan Gris, most of her other pictures having been sold. Gertrude Stein's personage has dominated the provenance of the Stein art legacy. It was, however, her brother Leo who was the astute art appraiser. Leo's eye for art guided them in buying the collection for which Gertrude later took most of the credit. Alfred Bard J.R founding director of New York's Museum of Modern Art has said that between the years of 1905 and 1907, was possibly the most discerning connoisseur and collector of 20th century painting in the world. After the artworks were divided between the two siblings, it was Gertrude Stein that moved on to champion the works of what proved to be lesser talents in the 1930s. She concentrated on the work of Juan Gris, André Masson, and Sir Francis Rose. In 1932, Stein asserted, painting now after its great period has come back to be a minor art. In 1945, in a preface for the first exhibition of Spanish painter Francisco Riba Rovira, who painted a portrait of her, Stein wrote. 27 Rue de Flores, the Stein Salon The gatherings in the Stein home brought together confluences of talent and thinking that would help define modernism in literature and art. Dedicated attendees included Pablo Picasso, Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Sinclair Lewis, James Joyce, Ezra Pound, Thornton Wilder, Sherwood Anderson, Francis Cyril Rose, René Creville, Elizabeth de Gramont, Francis Pickabier, Claribel Cohn, Mildred Aldrich, Carl Van Vechten and Henri Matisse. Saturday evenings had been set as the fixed day and time for formal congregations so Stein could work at her writing uninterrupted by impromptu visitors. It was Stein's partner Alice who became the de facto hostess for the wife and girlfriends of the artists in attendance, who met in a separate room. Upon the birth of his son, frequent attender Ernest Hemingway asked Stein to be the godmother of his child. During the summer of 1931, Stein advised the young composer and writer Paul Bowles to go to Tangier, where she and Alice had vacationed. Gertrude herself attributed the beginnings of the Saturday evening salons to Matisse, as Among Picasso's acquaintances who frequented the Saturday evenings were, Fernand Olivier, Picasso's mistress, Georges Braque, artist, André de Rain, artist, Max Jacob, poet, Guillaume Apollinaire, poet, Marie Laurenson artist, and Apollinaire's mistress, Henri Rousseau, painter, and Joseph Stella. While Stein has been credited with inventing the term lost generation for those whose defining moment in time and coming of age had been World War I and its aftermath, at least three versions of the story that led to the phrase are on record, two by Ernest Hemingway and one by Gertrude Stein. Literary Style 
Stein's writing can be placed in three categories, hermetic works best illustrated by The Making of Americans, The Hersland Family. Popularized writing such as the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, and speech writing and more accessible autobiographical writing of later years, of which Bruzy and Willie is a good example. Her works include novels, plays, stories, library and poems written in a highly idiosyncratic, playful, repetitive, and humorous style. Typical quotes are, Rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. Out of kindness comes redness and out of rudeness comes rapid same question, out of an eye comes research, out of selection comes painful cattle. About her childhood home in Oakland, there is no there there. And the change of color is likely and a difference of very little difference is prepared. Sugar is not a vegetable. These stream of consciousness experiments, rhythmical essays or portraits, were designed to evoke the excitingness of pure being and can be seen as literature's answer to cubism, plasticity, and collage. Many of the experimental works such as Tender Buttons have since been interpreted by critics as a feminist reworking of patriarchal language. These works were well received by avant-garde critics but did not initially achieve mainstream success. Despite Stein's work on automatic writing with William James, she did not see her work as automatic, but as an excess of consciousness. Though Gertrude collected Cubist paintings, especially those of Picasso, the largest visual influence on her work is that of Cezanne. Particularly, he influenced her idea of equality, distinguished from universality, the whole field of the canvas is important, p. 8. Rather than a figure-ground relationship, Stein in her work with words used the entire text as a field in which every element mattered as much as any other. It is a subjective relationship that includes multiple viewpoints. Stein explained, the important thing is that you must have deep down is the deepest thing in you a sense of equality. Her use of repetition is ascribed to her search for descriptions of the bottom nature of her characters, such as in The Making of Americans where the narrator is described through the repetition of narrative phrases such as as I was saying, and there will be now a history of her. Stein used many Anglo-Saxon words and avoided words with too much association. Social judgment is absent in her writing, so the reader is given the power to decide how to think and feel about the writing. Anxiety, fear and anger are also absent, and her work is harmonic and integrative. Stein predominantly used the present progressive tense, creating a continuous present in her work, which Gran argues is a consequence of the previous principles especially commonality and centeredness. Grant describes play as the granting of autonomy and agency to the readers or audience, rather than the emotional manipulation that is a characteristic of linear writing, Stein uses play. In addition Stein's work is funny, and multi-layered, allowing a variety of interpretations and engagements. Lastly Grant argues that one must insta-stand. Engage with the work, to mix with it in an active engagement rather than figuring it out. Figure it in. In 1932, using an accessible style to appeal to a wider audience, she wrote the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. The book would become her first bestseller. Despite the title, it was actually Stein's autobiography. The style was quite similar to that of the Alice B. Toklas cookbook, which was written by Toklas. Several of Stein's writings have been set to music by composers including Virgil Thompson's operas Four Saints in Three Acts and The Mother of Us All, and James Tenney's setting of Rose is a Rose is a Rose is a Rose is a canon dedicated to Philip Corner, beginning with A on an upbeat and continuing so that each repetition shuffles the words, for example a Rose is a Rose is a Rose is a Rose is a Rose. Literary Career While living in Paris, Stein began submitting her writing for publication. Her earliest writings were mainly retellings of her college experiences. Her first critically acclaimed publication was Three Lives. In 1911, Mildred Aldrich introduced Stein to Mabel Dodge Luhan and they began a short-lived but fruitful friendship during which the wealthy Mabel Dodge promoted Gertrude's legend in the United States. Mabel was enthusiastic about Stein's sprawling publication The Makings of Americans and, at a time when Stein had much difficulty selling her writing to publishers, 
privately published 300 copies of Portrait of Mabel Dodge at Villa Curonia, a copy of which was valued at $25,000 in 2007. Dodge was also involved in the publicity and planning of the 69th Armory Show in 1913, the first avant-garde art exhibition in America. In addition, she wrote the first critical analysis of Stein's writing to appear in America, in Speculations, or Post-Impressionists in Prose, published in a special March 1913 publication of Arts and Decoration. Foreshadowing Stein's later critical reception, Dodge wrote in Speculations. Stein and Carl Van Vechten, the noted critic and photographer, became acquainted in Paris in 1913. The two became lifelong friends, devising pet names for each other, Van Vechten was Papa Woodrums, and Stein, Baby Woodrums. Van Vechten served as an enthusiastic champion of Stein's literary work in the United States, in effect becoming her American agent. Stein in America 1934-1935 in October 1934, Stein arrived in America after a 30-year absence. Disembarking from the ocean liner in New York, she encountered a throng of reporters. Front-page articles on Stein appeared in almost every New York City newspaper. As she rode through Manhattan to her hotel, she was able to get a sense of the publicity that would hallmark her U.S. tour. An electric sign in Times Square announced to all that Gertrude Stein has arrived. Her six-month tour of the country encompassed 191 days of travel, crisscrossing 23 states and visiting 37 cities. The lecture Stein prepared for each stopover conformed to a formal structure, and the audience was limited to 500 attendees for each venue. She spoke, reading from notes, and provided for an audience question and answer period at the end of her presentation. The effectiveness of Stein as a lecture speaker provoked varying evaluations. At the time, some maintained that Stein's audiences by and large did not understand her lectures. Some of those in the psychiatric community weighed in, judging that Stein suffered from a speech disorder, palilalia, which caused her to stutter over words and phrases. The predominant feeling, however, was that Stein was a compelling presence, a fascinating personality who had the ability to hold listeners with the musicality of her language. In Washington, D.C. Stein was invited to have tea with the president's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. In Beverly Hills, California, she visited with Charlie Chaplin who reportedly discussed the future of cinema with her. Stein left America in May 1935, a newly minted America celebrity with a commitment from Random House, who had agreed to become the American publisher for all future works. The Chicago Daily Tribune wrote after Stein's return to Paris, No writer in years has been so widely discussed, so much caricatured, so passionately championed. Books QED Gertrude completed QED, Quod Erat Demon Strandum, on October 24, 1903. This piece is discussed more completely later in this article at Lesbian Relationships. Furnace 1904 In 1904 Stein began this fictional account of a scandalous three-person romantic affair involving a dean, M. Carey Thomas, and a faculty member, Mary Gwynne, from Bryn Mawr College and a Harvard graduate, Alfred Hodder. Mello asserts that Fernhurst is a decidedly minor and awkward piece of writing. It includes some commentary that Gertrude mentioned in her autobiography when she discussed the fateful 29th year during which Mello observes that, in 1904, 30-year-old Gertrude had evidently determined that the small hard reality of her life would be writing. Three Lives 1905-1906 Stein attributed the inception of this work to the inspiration she received from a portrait Cezanne had painted of his wife and which was in the Stein collection. She credited this as a revelatory moment in the evolution of her writing style. Stein described, She began her novel Three Lives during the spring of 1905, and finished it the following year. The Making of Americans 1902-1911 Gertrude Stein stated the date for her writing of The Making of Americans was 
her biographer has uncovered evidence that it actually began in 1902 and did not end until 1911. Stein compared her work to James Joyce's Ulysses and to Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time. Her critics were less enthusiastic about it. First publication in Alfred Stiglitz's camera work, August 1912. Further publication history Stein wrote the bulk of the novel between 1903 and 1911, and evidence from her manuscripts suggests three major periods of revision during that time. The manuscript remained mostly hidden from public view until 1924 when, at the urging of Ernest Hemingway, Ford Maddox Ford agreed to publish excerpts in the Transatlantic Review. In 1925, the Paris-based Contact Press published a limited run of the novel consisting of 500 copies. A much abridged edition was published by Harcourt Brace in 1934, but the full version remained out of print until Something Else Press republished it in 1966. In 1995, a new, definitive edition was published by Dalkey Archive Press with a foreword by William Gass. Gertrude's Matisse and Picasso descriptive essays appeared in Alfred Stiglitz's August 1912 edition of Camera Work, a special edition devoted to Picasso and Matisse and represented her very first publication. Of this publication, Gertrude said, he was the first one that ever printed anything that I had done. And you can imagine what that meant to me or to anyone. Word Portraits 1908-1913 Gertrude's descriptive essays apparently began with her essay of Alice B. Tokler's, a little prose vignette, a kind of happy inspiration that had detached itself from the torrential prose of the making of Americans. Gertrude's early efforts at word portraits are catalogued in Mello, 1974, pages 129 to 37, and under individuals' names in Kellner, 1988. Matisse and Picasso were subjects of early essays, later collected and published in Geography and Plays and Portraits and Prayers. Her subjects included several ultimately famous personages, and her subjects provided a description of what she observed in her Saturday salons at 27 Rue de Fleurus, Ada, Alice B. Toklas, two women, the Cohn sisters, Claribel Cohn and Etta Cohn, Miss Fur and Miss Skeen, Ethel Mars and Maud Hunt Squire, men, Hutchins Hapgood, Peter David Edstrom, Morris Stern, Matisse, 1909, Henri Matisse, Picasso. 1909, Pablo Picasso, Portrait of Mabel Dodge at the Villa Curonia, 1911, Mabel Dodge Luhan, and Guillaume Apollinaire, 1913. Tender Buttons 1912 Tender Buttons is the best known of Gertrude Stein's hermetic works. It is a small book separated into three sections, food, objects and rooms each containing prose under subtitles. Its publication in 1914 caused a great dispute between Mabel Dodge Luhan and Gertrude, because Mabel had been working to have it published by another publisher. Mabel wrote at length about the bad choice of publishing it with the press Gertrude selected. Evans wrote Gertrude. Stein ignored Mabel's exhortations, and eventually Mabel, and published 1,000 copies of the book, in 1914. An antiquarian copy was valued at over $1,200 in 2007. It is currently in print, and will be re-released as Tender Buttons, the corrected centennial edition by City Lights Publishers in April 2014. In an interview with Robert Barkett Haas in a Transatlantic Interview, 1946, Stein insisted that this work was completely realistic in the tradition of Gustave Flaubert, stating the following. I used to take objects on a table, like a tumbler or any kind of object and try to get the picture of it clear and separate in my mind and create a word relationship between the word and the thing seen. Commentators have indicated that what she meant was that the reference of objects remained central to her work, although the representation of them had not. Scholar Marjorie Perloff had said of Stein that NLIKE her contemporaries, Eliot, Pound, Moore, she does not give us an image however fractured, of a carafe on a table. Rather, she forces us to reconsider how language actually constructs the world we know. Alice B. Toklas Stein met her life partner Alice B. Toklas on September 8, 1907, 
on Togla's first day in Paris, at Sarah and Michael Stein's apartment. On meeting Stein, Tokler's wrote. Soon thereafter, Stein introduced Tokler's to Pablo Picasso at his studio, where he was at work on Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. In 1908, they summered in Fiesole, Italy, Tokler's staying with Harriet Lane Levy, the companion of her trip from the United States, and her housemate until Alice moved in with Stein and Leo in 1910. That summer, Stein stayed with Michael and Sarah Stein, their son Alan, and Leo in a nearby villa. Gertrude and Alice's summer of 1908 is memorialized in images of the two of them in Venice, at the piazza in front of St. Mark's. Tokler's arrived in 1907 with Harriet Levy, with Tokler's maintaining living arrangements with Levy until she moved to 27 Rue de Fleurus in 1910. In an essay written at the time, Stein discussed the complex efforts humorously, involving much letter writing and Victorian niceties. To extricate Levy from Tokler's living arrangements. In Harriet, Stein considers Levy's non existent plans for the summer, following her non existent plans for the winter. During the early summer of 1914, Gertrude bought three paintings by Juan Gris roses, glass and bottle, and book and glasses. Soon after she purchased them from Daniel Henry Carnella's gallery, the Great War began. Carnella's stock was confiscated and he was not allowed to return to Paris. Gris, who before the war had entered a binding contract with Carnella for his output, was left without income. Gertrude attempted to enter an ancillary arrangement in which she would forward Gris' living expenses in exchange for future pictures. Stein and Tokers had plans to visit England to sign a contract for the publication of Three Lives, to spend a few weeks there, and then journey to Spain. They left Paris on July 6, 1914 and returned on October 17. When Britain declared war on Germany, Stein and Tokers were visiting Alfred North Whitehead in England. After a supposed three-week trip to England that stretched to three months due to the war, they returned to France, where they spent the first winter of the war. With money acquired from the sale of Stein's last Matisse woman with a hat to her brother Michael, she and Tokler's vacationed in Spain from May 1915, through the spring of 1916. During their interlude in Mallorca, Spain, Gertrude continued her correspondence with Mildred Aldrich who kept her apprised of the war's progression, and eventually inspired Gertrude and Alice to return to France to join the war effort. Tokler's and Stein returned to Paris in June 1916, and acquired a Ford automobile with the help of associates in the United States. Gertrude learned to drive it with the help of her friend William Edwards Cook. Gertrude and Alice then volunteered to drive supplies to French hospitals, in the Ford they named Auntie, after Gertrude's Aunt Pauline, who always behaved admirably in emergencies and behaved fairly well most times if she was flattered. During the 1930s, Stein and Tokers became famous with the 1933 mass market publication of the autobiography of Alice B. Tokers. She and Alice had an extended lecture tour in the United States during this decade. They also spent several summers in the town of Bilignin, in the Aisne district of eastern France situated in the picturesque region of the Rhone Alps. The two women doted on their beloved poodle named Big Ken, whose successor, Big Ken's European vacation, comforted Alice in the years after Gertrude's death. With the outbreak of World War II, Stein and Tokers relocated to a country home that they had rented for many years previously in Bilignin, Ain, in the Rhone Alps region. Gertrude and Alice, who were both Jewish, escaped persecution probably because of their friendship to Bernard Fay, who was a collaborator with the Vichy regime and had connections to the Gestapo, or possibly because Gertrude was an American and a famous author. Gertrude's book Wars I Have Seen written before the German surrender and before the liberation of German concentration camps, likened the German army to Keystone Cops. When Fay was sentenced to hard labor for life after the war, Gertrude and Alice campaigned for his release. Several years later, Tokers would contribute money to Fay's escape from prison. After the war, Stein was visited by many young American soldiers. The April 6, 1945 issue of Life magazine featured a photo of Stein and American soldiers posing in front of Hitler's bunker in Berchtesgaden. They are all giving the Nazi salute and Stein is wearing the traditional Alpine cap, accompanied by the text, 
off we all went to see Germany. In the 1980s, a cabinet in the Yale University Beinecke Library, which had been locked for an indeterminate number of years was opened and found to contain some 300 love letters written by Stein and Toklas. They were made public for the first time, revealing intimate details of their relationship. Stein's endearment for Toklas was baby precious, in turn Stein was for Toklas, Mr. Cuddle Waddle. Lesbian Relationships Stein is the author of one of the earliest coming out stories, QED, published in 1950 as Things As They Are, written in 1903 and suppressed by the author. The story, written during travels after leaving college, is based on a three-person romantic affair she joined while studying at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. The affair was complicated, as Stein was less experienced with the social dynamics of romantic friendship as well as her own sexuality and any moral dilemmas regarding it. Stein maintained at the time that she detested passion in its many disguised forms. The relationships of Stein's acquaintances Mabel Haynes and Grace Lounsbury ended as Haynes started one with Mary Bookstaver, also known as May Bookstaver. Stein became enamored of Bookstaver but was unsuccessful in advancing their relationship. Bookstaver, Haynes, and Lounsbury all later married men. Stein began to accept and define her pseudo-masculinity through the ideas of Otto Weininger's Sex and Character, 1906. Weininger, though Jewish by birth, considered Jewish men effeminate and women as incapable of selfhood and genius, except for female homosexuals who may approximate masculinity. As Stein equated genius with masculinity, her position as a female and an intellectual becomes difficult to synthesize and modern feminist interpretations of her work have been called into question. More positive affirmations of Stein's sexuality began with her relationship with Alice B. Toklas. Ernest Hemingway describes how Alice was Gertrude's wife in that Stein rarely addressed his, Hemingway's, wife, and he treated Alice the same, leaving the two wives to chat. The more affirming essay Miss Fur and Miss Skeen is one of the first homosexual revelation stories to be published. The work, like QED, is informed by Stein's growing involvement with the homosexual community, though it is based on lesbian partners Maud Hunt Squire and Ethel Mars. The work contains the word gay over 100 times, perhaps the first published use of the word gay in reference to same-sex relationships and those who have them, and, thus, Uninformed readers miss the lesbian content. A similar essay of homosexual men begins more obviously with the line sometimes men are kissing, but is less well known. Intended Buttonstein comments on lesbian sexuality in the work abounds with highly condensed layers of public and private meanings created by wordplay including puns on the words box, cow, and in titles such as tender buttons. There is no there there. Along with A Rose is a Rose is a Rose is a Rose, there is no there there is one of Gertrude Stein's most famous quotes. It appears in Gertrude Stein, Everybody's Autobiography, Random House 1937, p. 289, and is often applied to the city of her childhood, Oakland, California. Defenders and critics of Oakland have debated what she really meant when she said this in 1933 after coming to San Francisco on a book tour. She took a ferry to Oakland to visit the farm she grew up on, and the house she lived in near what is now 13th Avenue and E 25th Street in Oakland. The house had been raised and the farmland had been developed with new housing in the three decades since her father had sold the property and moved closer to the commercial hub of the neighborhood on Washington Street, now 12th Avenue. She wrote. Political Views According to Janet Malcolm's contested account in Two Lives, Gertrude and Alice, Stein was a vocal critic of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal. Others have stressed her queer, feminist, pro-immigration, and democratic politics. She publicly endorsed General Francisco Franco during the Spanish Civil War and admired Vichy leader Marshal Philippe Pétain. Some have argued for a more nuanced view of Stein's collaborationist activity arguing that it was rooted in her wartime predicament and status as a Jew in Nazi-occupied France. Similarly, Stein commented at 1938 on Benito Mussolini, Adolf Hitler, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Joseph Stalin and Leon Trotsky, 
there is too much fathering going on just now and there is no doubt about it fathers are depressing. Stein during World War II While identified with the modernist movements in art and literature, Stein's political affiliations were a mix of reactionary and progressive ideas. She was outspoken in her hostility to some liberal reforms of progressive politics. To Stein, the Industrial Revolution had acted as a negative societal force, disrupting stability, degrading values, and subsequently affecting cultural decline. Stein idealized the 18th century as the golden age of civilization, epitomized in America as the era of its founding fathers and what was in France, the glory of its pre-revolutionary ancien regime. At the same time, she was pro-immigrant, pro-democratic, and anti-patriarchal. Her last major work was the libretto of the feminist opera The Mother of Us All, 1947, about the socially progressive suffragette movement and another work from this time, Bruzy and Willie, 1946, expressed strong support for American GIS. A compendium of source material confirms that Stein may have been able to save her life and sustain her lifestyle through the protection of powerful Vichy government official Bernard Fay. Stein had met Fay in 1926, and he became her dearest friend during her life, according to Alice B. Toklas. Fay had been the primary translator of Stein's work into French and subsequently masterminded her 1933-34 American book tour which gave Stein celebrity status and proved to be a highly successful promotion of her memoir, The Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. Fay's influence was instrumental in avoiding Nazi confiscation of the Stein's historically significant and monetarily valuable collection of artwork, which throughout the war years was housed in Stein's Paris Rue Christine apartment, under locked safeguard. In 1941, at Fay's suggestion, Stein consented to translate into English some 180 pages of speeches made by Marshal Philippe Pétain. In her introduction, Stein crafts an analogy between George Washington and Pétain. She writes of the high esteem in which Pétain is held by his countrymen. France respected and admired the man who had struck an armistice with Hitler. Conceived and targeted for an American readership, Stein's translations were ultimately never published in the United States. Random House publisher Bennett Cerf had read the introduction Stein had written for the translations and been horrified by what she had produced. Of Jewish parentage, Stein collaborated with Vichy France, a regime that deported more than 75,000 Jews to concentration camps, of whom only 3% survived the Holocaust. In 1944, Stein wrote that Pétain's policies were really wonderful so simple so natural so extraordinary. This was Stein's contention in the year when the town of Kulas, where she and Toklas resided, saw the removal of its Jewish children to Auschwitz. It is difficult to say, however, how aware Stein was of these events. As she wrote in Wars I have seen, however near a war is it is always not very near. Even when it is here. Stein had stopped translating Petain's speeches three years previously, in 1941. Stein was able to condemn the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor while simultaneously maintaining the dissonant acceptance of Hitler as conqueror of Europe. Journalist Lanning Warren interviewed Stein in her Paris apartment in a piece published in the New York Times magazine on May 6, 1934. Stein, seemingly ironically, proclaimed that Hitler merited the Nobel Peace Prize. Given that after the war Stein commented that the only way to ensure world peace was to teach the Germans disobedience, this 1934 Stein interview has come to be interpreted as an ironic jest made by a practiced iconoclast hoping to gain attention and provoke controversy. Gustav Hendriksen, who claimed, contrary to all available evidence, to have been a member of the Nobel Committee in the 1930s, attempted to refute this analysis in the 1990s. He claimed that Stein's bid for Hitler's Nobel honor was indeed made in earnest. In 1938, Stein allegedly spearheaded a campaign urging the Nobel Committee to consider Adolf Hitler for nomination of the Peace Prize. Hendriksen recounts that the committee formally rejected Stein's proposal politely but firmly citing among their reasons the attitude of the Nazis towards Jews. However, Hendriksen is not listed on the Nobel Prize Committee in the 1930s, and beside his spurious claim, 
there is no evidence whatsoever that Stein ever made such a nomination or recommendation nor that Hendrickson is a real person. In an effort to correct popular mainstream misrepresentations of Stein's wartime activity, a dossier of articles by critics and historians has been gathered for the online journal Jacket 2. How much of Stein's wartime activities were motivated by the real exigencies of self-preservation in a dangerous environment, can only be speculated upon. However, her loyalty to Petain may have gone beyond expedience. She had been urged to leave France by American embassy officials, friends and family when that possibility still existed, but declined to do so. Accustomed to a life of entitlement since birth, Stein may have been convinced her wealth and notoriety would exempt her from what had befallen other European Jews. In an essay written for the Atlantic Monthly in November 1940, Stein had written about her decision not to leave France, it would be awfully uncomfortable and I am fussy about my food. Stein continued to praise Pétain after the war ended, this at a time when Pétain had been sentenced to death by a French court for treason. Author Juna Barnes provided a caustic assessment of Stein's book, Wars I Have Seen. Others have argued that some of the accounts of Stein's wartime activities have amounted to a witch hunt. Death Stein died at the age of 72 from stomach cancer in Neuilly sur Seine on July 27, 1946, and was interred in Paris in Palaches Cemetery. When Stein was being wheeled into the operating room for surgery on her stomach, she asked Toklas, what is the answer? When Toklas did not reply, Stein said, in that case, what is the question? Stein named writer and photographer Carl Van Vechten as her literary executor, and he helped to publish works of hers that remained unpublished at the time of her death. There is a monument to Stein on the upper terrace of Bryant Park, New York. Critical reception of Stein as writer Sherwood Anderson in his public introduction to Stein's 1922 publication of Geography and Place wrote, In a private letter to his brother Carl, Anderson said, as for Stein, I do not think her too important. I do think she had an important thing to do, not for the public, but for the artist who happens to work with words as his material. Other critics took a more negative view of Stein's work. F. W. Dupay, 1990, p. 9, defines Steinese as gnomic, repetitive, illogical, sparsely punctuated. A scandal and a delight lending itself equally to derisory parody and fierce denunciation. Composer Constant Lambert, 1936, compares Stravinsky's choice of the drabbest and least significant phrases in L'Estoy du Soldat to Gertrude Stein's and Helen Furr and Jagin's scheme, 1922, specifically, very day they were gay there, they were regularly gay there every day. He writes that the effect would be equally appreciated by someone with no knowledge of English whatsoever apparently missing the pun frequently employed by Stein. James Thurber wrote. Author Catherine Ann Porter provided her own estimation of Stein's literary legacy, wise or silly or nothing at all, down everything goes on the page with an air of everything being equal, unimportant in itself important because it happened to her and she was writing about it. History professor Blanche Wisencook has written of Stein, she was not a radical feminist. She was Jewish and anti-Semitic, lesbian and contemptuous of women, ignorant about economics and hostile to socialism. Writing for Vanity Fair magazine in 1923, eminent literary critic Edmund Wilson presciently came to an evaluation similar to the one made by Catherine Ann Porter some twenty years later, after Stein's death. Wilson deemed that Stein's technique was one of flawed methodology, using words analogous to the way Cubists manipulated abstract forms in their artworks. As Wilson wrote, unlike the plastic arts, literature deals with an elevated observer, perched high above everything below, he likened Stein to a self-conceived Buddha, registering impressions like some august seismograph. Stein's literary output was a subject of amusement for her brother Leo Stein, who characterized her writing as an abomination. Later detractors of Stein's work deemed her experimentation as the serendipitous result of her alleged inability to communicate through linguistic convention, deficient in the skills required to deal effectively with language, 
so that she made her greatest weakness into her most remarkable strength. Legacy and Commemoration Gertrude Stein has been the subject of many artistic works. Stein and Tokler's merit their own line each in the song Bosom Bodies from the 1966 Broadway musical M.A.M.E., based on the stage play Auntie Mame, by composer-lyricist Jerry Herman. In M.A.M.E., Vera Charles, Mame Dennis actress confident pal, sings. I'll always be Alice Tokler's, if you'll be Gertrude Stein. B. Arthur who played the original Vera Charles on Broadway, recreated the same role for the 1974 film version of the musical. In the 1998 Latin American literary classic Yo-Yo Boyan, novelist Gianna Nabroi pays homage to Stein as an imaginary mentor. In 2005, playwright-actor Jade Esteban Estrada portrayed Stein in the solo musical Icons, The Lesbian and Gay History of the World, Volume 1 at Princeton University. Loving Repeating is a musical by Stephen Flaherty based on the writings of Gertrude Stein. Stein and Alice B. Toklas are both characters in the eight-person show. Stein is a central character in Nick Batozzi's 2007 graphic novel The Salon. The posthumously published journals of Ayn Rand contain several highly hostile references to Gertrude Stein. From Rand's working notes for her novel The Fountainhead, it is clear that the character Lois Cook in that book was intended as a caricature of Stein. Stein was also portrayed in the 2011 Woody Allen film Midnight in Paris by Kathy Bates. Her name is added to a list of great artists and notables in the popular Broadway musical Rent in the Song Love by Bohem. Also mentioned in the Astaire, Rogers' 1935 film Top Hat. She is mentioned in the song Rosability by the Scottish rock group Ida Wild. Composer Ricky Ian Gordon's and librettist Royce Fevrek's Opera 27 about Stein and Tokers is scheduled to be premiered at Opera Theatre of St. Louis in June 2014 with Stephanie Blythe as Stein. Published works Three Lives, The Grafton Press, 1909, White Wines, 1913, Tender Buttons, Objects, Food, Rooms, 1914, Online at Bartleby. An Exercise in Analysis, 1917, A Circular Play, 1920, Stein, Gertrude, 1999, Geography and Plays, Minera, New York, Dover, ISBN 0-486-408744, The Making of Americans, Being a History of a Family's Progress, Written 1906-8, Published 1925, Four Saints in Three Acts, Libretto, 1929, Music by Virgil Thompson, 1934, Useful Knowledge, 1929, How to Write, 1931, They Must Be Wedded to Their Wife, 1931, Stein, Gertrude, 1998, Operas and Plays, Barrytown, New York, Station Hill Arts, ISBN 1-886449-16-3. Matisse Picasso and Gertrude Stein with Two Shorter Stories, 1933, The Autobiography of Alice B. Tokers, 1933, Stein, Gertrude, 1934, Portraits and Prayers, New York, Random House, ISBN 978-1-135-76198-1, Lectures in America, 1935. The Geographical History of America or the Relation of Human Nature to the Human Mind, 1936, Everybody's Autobiography, 1937, Picasso, 1938, Dr. Faustus Lights the Lights, 1938, The World is Round, 1939, Paris, France, 1940, Idea Novel, 1941, Three Sisters Who Are Not Sisters, 1943, Walls I Have Seen, 1945A, Stein, Gertrude, à la recherche et d'un jeune painter, USA, Yale University, 1945B, à la recherche et d'un jeune painter, in Fauche, Max Paul, Revue Fontaine, Paris, 42, 287-8, 1946A, Reflections on the Atom Bomb, University of Pennsylvania, Bruzy and Willie, 1946B, The Mother of Us All. Libretto, 1946 c. Music by Virgil Thompson 1947. Stein, 
Gertrude, 1946 D. Gertrude Stein on Picasso, London, B. T. Batsford, ISBN 978-0-87140-513-5, Van Vechten, Carl, ed., Last Operas and Plays, Baltimore and London, The Johns Hopkins University Press, ISBN 0-8018-4985-3, The Things As They Are, written as QED. In 1903, published 1950. Patriarchal Poetry, 1953, Alphabets and Birthdays, 1957, Stein, Gertrude, 1970, Burns, Edward, ed., Gertrude Stein on Picasso, New York, Liverite Publishing, ISBN 0-87140-513-X, Stein, Gertrude. Van Vechten, Carl, 1986, Burns, Edward, ed., the Letters of Gertrude Stein and Carl Van Vechten, 1913-1946, New York, Columbia University Press, ISBN 978-0-231-06308-1, Stein, Gertrude. Wilder, Thornton, 1996, Burns, Edward. Dido, Uller, Eds, The Letters of Gertrude Stein and Thornton Wilder, Yale University Press. ISBN 978-0-300-06774-3, Stein, Gertrude, 1998A, Chess Man, Harriet. Katharina, Eds, Writings 1903-1932, Library of America, ISBN 978-1-883011-40-6, 1998 B, Chess Man, Harriet. Katharina, Eds, Writings 1932-1946, Library of America, ISBN 978-1-883011-41-3, Toklas, Alice, 1973, Burns, Edward, ed., Staying on Alone, Letters, New York, Liverite, ISBN 0-87140-569-5, Gran, Judy, ed., 1989, Really Reading Gertrude Stein, a selected anthology with essays by Judy Gran, Crossing Press, ISBN 0-89594-380-8, Vechten, Carl Van, ed. 1990. Selected Writings of Gertrude Stein. ISBN 0-679-72464-8. Related exhibits The Steins Collect, Matisse, Picasso, and the Parisian Avant-Garde, the Metropolitan Museum of Art of New York, February 28, June 3, 2012. The Steins Collect, Matisse, Picasso, and the Parisian Avant-Garde, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, May 21, 2011, September 6, 2011 Check date values in, date equals, help. Seeing Gertrude Stein, Five Stories, Washington, D.C. The National Portrait Gallery, Smithsonian Institution, October 14, 2011, January 22, 2012 Check date values in, date equals, help. Seeing Gertrude Stein, Five Stories, San Francisco, Contemporary Jewish Museum, May 12, 2011, September 6, 2011 Check date values in, date equals, help. Four Saints in Three Acts, Four Live Presentations of a New Production, San Francisco, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, August 18-21, 2011, Picasso, Masterpieces from the Massé National Picasso, Paris, San Francisco, M. H. de Young Memorial Museum, June 11, 2011, October 9, 2011 Check date values in, date equals, help, Reba Rovira Year 2012 Galeria Moro. Homenage for Gertrude Stein, Valencia. Her mother died in 1888 and her father in 1891. Michael Stein, the eldest brother, took over the family business holdings. He arranged for Gertrude and another sister, Bertha, to live with their mother's family in Baltimore after the deaths of their parents. In 1892, she lived with her uncle David Backratch. Backratch had married Fanny Keyser, sister of Gertrude's mother Amelia 
in 1877. In Baltimore, Stein met Claribel Cohn and Etta Cohn, who held Saturday evening salons that she would later emulate in Paris. The Cones shared an appreciation for art and conversation about art and modeled a domestic division of labor that Stein would replicate in her relationship with Alice B. Toklas. Education Radcliffe Stein attended Radcliffe College, then an annex of Harvard University, from 1893 to 1897 and was a student of psychologist William James. With James's supervision, Stein and another student, Leon Mendes Solomons, performed exp Johns Hopkins. William James, who had become a committed mentor to Stein at Radcliffe, recognizing her intellectual potential, and declaring her his most brilliant woman student, encouraged Stein to enroll in medical school, although Stein professed she had no interest in either the theory or practice of medicine. She spent two years at Johns Hopkins Medical School, failing two courses and leaving without a degree. Ultimately, medical school had bored Stein, and she had spent many of her evenings not applying herself to her studies, but taking long walks and attending the opera. Stein's tenure at Johns Hopkins was marked by challenge and stress. Men dominated the medical field, and the inclusion of women in the profession was not unreservedly or unanimously welcomed. Writing of this period in her life, Things As They Are, 1903, Stein often revealed herself as a depressed young woman dealing with a paternalistic culture, struggling to find her own identity which she realized could not conform to the conventional female role. Her uncorseted physical appearance and eccentric mode of dress aroused comment and she was described Gertrude Stein Gertrude Stein was an American writer of novels, poetry and plays that eschewed the narrative, linear, and temporal conventions of 19th century literature, and a fervent collector of modernist art. She was born in West Allegheny, Pennsylvania, raised in Oakland, California, and moved to Paris in 1903, making France her home for the remainder of her life. For some 40 years, the Stein home at 27 Rue de Fleurus on the left bank of Paris was a renowned Saturday evening gathering place for both expatriate American artists and writers and others noteworthy in the world of vanguard arts and letters, most notably Pablo Picasso. Entree into the Stein Salon was a sought-after validation, and Stein became combination mentor, critic, and guru to those who gathered around her, including Ernest Hemingway, who described the Salon in A Movable Feast. In 1933, Stein published a kind of memoir of her Paris years, the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, written in the voice of Toklas, her life partner. The book became a literary bestseller and vaulted Stein from the relative obscurity of cult literary figure into the light of mainstream attention. Early Life Gertrude Stein, the youngest of a family of five children, was born on February 3, 1874, in Allegheny, Pennsylvania, merged with Pittsburgh in 1907, to upper-class Jewish parents, Daniel and Amelia Stein. German and English were spoken at their home. Stein's father was a wealthy businessman with real estate holdings, and director of San Francisco Street Car Lines, the Market Street Railway, in an era when public transportation was a privately owned enterprise. When Stein was three years old she and her family moved to Vienna and then Paris. Accompanied by governesses and tutors, the Steins endeavored to imbue their children with the cultured sensibilities of European history and life. After a year-long sojourn abroad, they returned to America in 1878, settling in Oakland, California, where Stein attended First Hebrew Congregation of Oakland Sabbath School. Experiments on normal motor automatism, a phenomenon hypothesized to occur in people when their attention is divided between two simultaneous intelligent activities such as writing and speaking. These experiments yielded examples of writing that appeared to represent stream of consciousness, a psychological theory often attributed to James and the style of modernist authors Virginia Woolf and James Joyce. In 1934, Behavioral psychologist B. F. Skinner interpreted Stein's difficult poem Tender Buttons as an example of normal motor automatism. In a letter Stein wrote during the 1930s, she explained that she never accepted the theory of automatic writing, 
Here can be automatic movements, but not automatic writing. Writing for the normal person is too complicated an activity to be indulged in automatically. At Radcliffe, she began a lifelong friendship with Mabel Foot Weeks, whose correspondence traces much of the progression of Stein's life. In 1897, Stein spent the summer in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, studying embryology at the Marine Biological Laboratory. 